Yay. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Let's get started. So uh, quick background. We've had so much momentum with the highlighter uh, discussions that we've been having that we decided to bring them all back. And we actually built this uh, beta tool that we're using today. So thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us on this. And let us know if there's any problems. You can always DM us with feedback. Yeah, um, I'm super excited for the session. First of all, Lee is amazing and hosts this incredible means of creation podcast every week that I've been tuning into. Um, but I think this is super relevant because there's been so much buzz about the creator economy and the passion economy. And I, I feel like a lot of it ignores the vast majority of creators themselves who are not really able to make any sort of tenable living off of their work. So I think this is a really important and very uh, under discussed topic. So, very exciting. so quick, quick note on format here. Uh, it's really magic when we keep it really participatory. So uh, we're going to be watching the chat. And there's already some discussion questions flowing in there. Uh, feel free to you know, chime in and chat. And uh, we'll invite some of you up throughout the course of the session. Um, and FYI, it is on the record, uh, including chat. So people who couldn't make it can learn from it, too. And we'll produce a video after the fact. Yep. Cool. And just make sure you're using Chrome on desktop. Also. Yes. <laughs> Um, so cool. Before we get started, we're going to have David give an intro of Lee, but I also wanted everyone to chime in on chat with something like, if you guys are creators, what are you working on and what are you creating? Um, I'm sure we would love to talk about kind of things that you're struggling with or input you have based on that for Lee. All right. So to David for the intro. Oh, all right. I'm live. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is David. This is a, an amazing collision of worlds because Little known fact, DK is the very first person that I talked to and pitched about my startup, I think four years ago. And it was a big part of helping me raise my first ever institutional check. Uh, and then fast forward to today, I can't remember exactly who introduced me to Lee, but I was really excited about this sort of passion creator economy trying to, I get all spun up about trying to save capitalism and improve the middle class. And so somebody put me in touch with Lee and within like 15 minutes of our very first meeting, she was casually dropping quotes from The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I, it. I am intellectually outgunned now that. Uh, and it was a 30 minute meeting, which ended up going like two hours, ranting and raving about how to solve capitalism and how to create an economic force that empowers a brand new wave of people. Um, and, you know, it's been pretty wild. She's obviously already was the face of, of this space, but even more so, um, I think it tried to pull up the Google results for creator economy. And um, her uh, result resistance is the number one result. And so, um, you know, she doesn't really need this introduction, but historically uh, was at, or sort of previously was at in Greece now runs Atelier Avengers, um, Solo GP Fun, uh, runs a show called Means of Creation, runs Side Hustle Stack, which just went viral on TikTok, with 2.5 million views or something crazy. Um, she also runs my favorite uh, Slack community, and the only one I've actually stuck with, um, Passion Economy Pals, um, very exclusive. Um, and more importantly, if not most importantly, loves corgis and is super yeah. good at painting. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm excited to hear her uh, talk more. She doesn't seem to sleep and is basically constantly painting everybody on Slack about how to empower the creator economy. Um, I've never met anyone who thinks more deeply about this space. So without further ado, um, we. Oh, thanks. Amazing. I, that was I, the I, most I, amazing introduction I've ever heard, honestly. <laughs> like I was promised 45 minutes, so I'm <laughs> I, I told David that he would have 45 minutes for his intro, and I could answer questions for the last 15 minutes. Yeah. Keep, keep sprinkling in the Lee facts. We won't know <laughs> throughout the session. Also, fun fact, David, McDonough is secretly a celebrity because he just appeared on the front cover of the New York Times. Not like a section cover, but he was on the front right? of the New York Times. Wow. 
below the fold, right? But still, at the front page. <laughs> wow. I'll send everybody a follow up of the picture. It's yeah. Not, not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Okay. Well, I actually want to throw it back for the first question to College Lee. Um, you were, you were slash are a creator yourself. So your paintings are amazing. Lee studied paintings uh, for 13 years, I think <laughs> I read online. Um, and then you also studied English at Harvard. And you said when we first chatted that you were thinking about becoming a professional writer at some point. So I was wondering how you thought about kind of your career in college related to sort of being a creator full time and what sort of led you on the path that you are now and what, what went into that decision making? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think in a parallel universe, I would be in some sort of creative field being a creator full time myself, um, probably either as a writer, journalist, novelist um, of some sort, or if I flatter myself, maybe a professional artist, although I don't think I'm good enough for that. Um, but yeah, at the beginning of college, I studied English. I was really involved in student journalism. I thought that that would be my career in the future. I threw myself into reporting. I spent 40 hours a week at the Harvard Crimson Building, skipped all my classes to call up all my sources, wrote at least one article per day. Um, just loved it so much. And I also worked at my hometown newspaper, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, covering business and economics and covered the G20 conference when I was 19 years old. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I loved it. I still, I mean, it's still a big part of what I do now, um, albeit I don't monetize it at all. But writing has always been a huge passion of mine. I'm obsessed with literature, especially Victorian literature. Um, I compare myself to Jane Eyre a lot, uh, but <laughs> in terms of how my writing um, activities have sort of progressed, um, yeah, I've just always had this as a hobby, a, a continuous theme throughout my life. I used to write fan fiction online when I was really little, Harry Potter fan fiction. Then I blogged um, ever since I was about nine or ten years old, first on platforms like Zanga, then LiveJournal, then um, Tumblr, um, Blogspot. I've used every blogging platform out there and just writing has been a consistent part of my life forever. Uh, so I love doing it. And I think what has always been a source of tension in my life is having all of these creative hobbies that I love to do, but not really seeing any path to be able to make a living from them. Um, and actually the reason why I ended up not graduating as an English literature major is because um, I'm going to throw my mom under the bus here. I love my mom, but she calls me up one day in the middle of like my sophomore year. And she's like, Hey, so, um, I'm really like embarrassed about telling all of my friends that you're an English major and that my daughter who is so smart and talented is squandering this opportunity at Harvard to study English literature. Um, and I think you really need to switch to something different because have you ever seen the job section of a newspaper? Have you ever seen like any listing for a professional writer in there? Like, no, that just, that's not a job that exists. Uh, and so <laughs> that's how that call went. She now acknowledges that I would have probably been just fine if I had continued and studied English, but regardless um, that the rest is history and now I'm venture capitalist and I studied math instead but I think that story and like my entire childhood in which I was expected to cultivate all of these creative interests and expected to be really good at painting and writing and and all of these things but then the minute you turn 18 and you go to college you're expected to just pursue something completely different that, that makes you money like that tension has always been a consistent theme in my life and I think a lot of kids lives and so what I'm doing now as an investor and with this new firm is I'm trying to make it such that future generations of kids no longer have to choose between do I study English and bring shame upon my family or do I am I able to support myself financially like I, I do I do hope and I am optimistic that there is going to be a broader path for people to be able to pursue 
whatever it is that they love as they're living in the future. That's yeah. great. I think a lot of immigrant kids studying the humanities and wanting to be creators could probably relate to that <laughs> for sure. But I'm also curious about how you sort of got into, how did you end up first mixing these two worlds and getting into the fashion economy and uh, thinking about creators in your career? Yeah, um, I think I've thought about creators ever since there was a, was a term for them. And that's because I was a creator myself on the early internet, like first with blogging. Um, I was a participant in a lot of online forums. I was kind of famous on Neopets, on the help forum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, I blogged throughout my childhood. I was like really engaged in lots of fan fiction communities online. Um, and, and those were the days in which no one called themselves a creator and no one earned any money from this because people were still afraid to put their credit card numbers into websites. And so everyone was doing it as a labor of love and just putting things out there because they love to create things. Um, and then eventually I found my way into investing and specifically consumer investing. And I, for the past four years when I was at E16Z, I covered marketplaces and other network effects businesses. Um, and most marketplaces that we saw were, um, well, at the beginning of my time there were really gig economy marketplaces, things mm -hmm. that facilitated people being able to make money, but but doing so in a way that was like involved really rote kind of repetitive work that they didn't really enjoy all that much. And so you would look at some of these platforms churn numbers and it turned out that they went through all of their suppliers over the course of a year and had to continually replenish the top of the funnel in order to get people to continue um, providing that service. And there was a moment um, when I was looking at marketplaces and I met the founder of OutSchool, which is this online education platform for kids in K through 12. It allows any adult to sign up as a teacher on the platform to create their own curriculum and to offer it as a live online class to kids all around the country. And I remember the founder telling me, um, OutSchool is one of the only ways for our demographic of teachers who are by and large like stay-at-home moms in the middle of the country. It's one of the only ways that they can flexibly make money by doing something other than driving a car or delivering food. It's like one of the only ways that they can make money that exercises their creativity and their education. And I thought that that was so powerful because if we are given the option, like all else being equal, to monetize in a way where we can use our creativity and our education and our imagination, and really express ourselves through our work versus just making money doing something that we don't really enjoy, I think most people would pick the former. Um, and so- It seems like it provides more economic opportunity versus doing kind of a commoditized, homogeneous, you know, if you're driving for Uber, you're sort of replaceable, whereas if you're contributing some sort of creative work, you're finding a niche, you know, I think you're, you're sort of expressing the thing that's uniquely you, and presumably that's gonna be more valuable to that kind of that kind of a person. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the only way to resist being really commoditized by a platform and to maintain any sort of pricing power, or customer mm -hmm. loyalty. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and then I realized that more and more marketplaces were designing themselves in this way, where they were not only offering like an interesting value proposition to the consumer side, but they were trying to really create a attractive option for, for suppliers and creators to be able to monetize mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so that's that's the origin story of this yeah. that's great why well, I, I um yeah I, thanks for for sharing all the background i think it helps us get a sense of sort of where you come from um one thing you mentioned was neopets and one of the people that uh, i invited up from our community to ask an early question is nabil hyatt who i think you already know uh, yes. the reason i think about nabil and neopets is because nabil happens to have a a checkered history as I do in uh, in the gaming creation world. <laughs> and so I wonder, um, yeah, I wonder if there's something around that that Nabil has in mind. I'll invite him up here. 
first of all, I was a user of Neopets, so let's we can we can we can talk to that. And as a um, as a as a son of a first generation immigrant who let me go to art school, like the amount of self control my mother exhibited to um, to let me take that path. Uh, is I, I've always been incredibly thankful for her because she felt exactly like your mother did, mm-hmm. um, and she tried to bottle it up uh, uh, quite a bit, and then made me feel guilty about it later. But whatever. Um, I, I, actually have a, I actually have a slightly you can different... work out your childhood trauma. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. You can turn it into all of us. I, I see it in the chat as well. A bunch of other people. Kind of yeah, we just have a group well. therapy session. <laughs> but actually, I, I, look, I actually have a I have a question for you. I, this is like one of the I wish more people wrote as thoughtfully as you do about tech um, and about the things that people are building. This is one of the best essays I've read this year, uh, really thoughtful, and I kind of want to read it again in a week and kind of think about it again, to be honest, which doesn't happen very often. Um, One of the things, a question I have for you is actually a little bit of like, it it feels like the only times we've gotten solid middle classes in economies um, is generally, and you touched on this a little bit in the piece, but generally I think of it as like, you have to have one of two things, either um, regulation, like the rise of labor laws in, in mid-century in the U.S., um, or you have to have, like, network inefficiencies. Like, like, service jobs last longer in local economies than outsourced jobs because, like, a nail salon is not a thing I can get digitally. Um, and both of those things feel inherently the opposite of the way things are built in digital world, right? They are network economies, um, with lower regulation, like inherently, um, and and I guess I, I'm curious with that in mind, like who is this essay aimed at? Like it, it's kind of a structure of how to think about a rising middle class, which I think we would all want inside of our creator economy, but those two things aren't really natural forming elements inside of any of these companies. And so I, I'm curious when you were writing this essay, who were you thinking about as the kind of receiver of that information? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Um, that's really, really high praise, so it means a lot. When I wrote the essay, I was writing it primarily with these platform builders in mind, like people who could actually put these ideas and strategies into place. But more broadly, I was writing it to the entire tech ecosystem because I think having lived in Silicon Valley since I mean, not that long, since 2013. I think a lot of people have sort of lost sight of what is it all for? Like, why are we working in technology? Why are we building these companies that we're building? Why are we trying to get these investments marked up and used by more people? Like, it's just been a fact that technology and progress in technology has always resulted in productivity improvements. For people like we we're, we're able to produce more feed more connect more people house more people be, because of technology but like we as builders and participants in society we have the job of deciding how those productivity gains and how that value gets distributed and i think that's been not talked about and sort of forgotten from what i've seen um in in the past few years and I think it's people have taken on just this mindset of growth at all costs and like all technology is good without thinking about like who is the actual beneficiary of it. Um, so I was trying to write this as sort of a reminder to all of us, like there are, there are implications of the things that we build. Um, we're not just building them in a silo. They touch everyone in the world we're actually shaping society and the economy and our actions and the way that we design these platforms have a real impact on how value and opportunity are distributed in the world. And so, yeah, I I wanted to put it out there as um, just to seed that thought into people's minds um, as they're working on products like Facebook and Instagram and Twitch and Substack, etc. Like it, it's not just a cool nifty product that people are spending lots of time on. These are more and more representing um, entirely new like sources of economic opportunity for people. People are 
coming to rely on them for income. Like with the shutdown of Mixer over the summer, there were, um, I saw things online where streamers on Mixer were breaking down in tears because their job had been completely taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And if that was like a company that was just blowing up overnight and people had like, that had been people's full-time jobs, then I think we would all be in uproar. But because it was a platform and, and these are like platform enabled forms of work, they're just a little bit more foreign to all of us. Um, but One quick yeah. follow-up though, like, like one thing I wish, maybe it's a, for a follow-up essay for you or something or a follow-up dialogue, like I think you put that in, that in the context of a creator and and us thinking about the people that operate and make money on the platforms that are being built, which I think is really important. But the thing you touch on in the beginning is also true, which is that you know you put it in the context of the United States as a it's also long term a more competitive marketplace that will attract more people, and so it is both long term good as well. It's it, you know. We can try and give a bunch back and then go out of business in three months, and then that doesn't help anybody. Um, what I don't think we've seen a lot of, and I, I don't know if you have good examples of this, uh, of situations where people have put in place those inefficiencies, put in place the creator UBI, put in place these these structures, and then therefore that long, maybe short term, slightly less growth, or maybe not, but long term creates a more competitive marketplace. You get more creative supply, and therefore you win. You have do you have when you think of companies like that, do you think of companies that are doing that today or historically have done that so we can help pick a picture for those and these that these are the ecosystems they want to build? Yeah, I think the most salient example that I can think of this, and this company is no by no means like doing a perfect job, um, but I think has really kind of taken a whole generation by storm, is TikTok. And I think TikTok has risen up in the past 18 months in an environment in which people thought consumer social was over. Like when I was investing two years ago, three years ago, people thought consumer social had been played out and the network effects of the existing platforms was just too strong and there might not be another one ever again. And all of a sudden here comes TikTok and like now people are spending, teens are spending way more time on TikTok than any other social platform. Um, and it's just staggering the amount of growth that it has. And I think a lot of it does tie back to how much they've empowered creators and how they make it possible for anyone to be able to become famous. Whereas if you talk to people trying to get started today on Instagram or on YouTube, it, the perception is it is a lot harder. I don't have the quantitative numbers to prove this, but there, the creator perception that it's easier to become famous on TikTok and it's easier to build up an audience there I think it does accrue to more value that the platform has. Um, in terms of like short-term sacrifices that they've made, I think the TikTok Creator Fund and putting $2 billion into the hands of creators, it definitely does something. Um, even if the $2 billion doesn't translate into very high CPM, um, it still amounts to a ton of goodwill that they're building among their creator base that translates into greater creator investment into the platform because they feel like the platform is it has it respects them it treats them as a first class citizen yeah i want to bring ej in actually um too and i wonder ej you can explain some of your reactions to the piece and what was behind this question but you had in chat um kind of a question about underlooked platforms or vehicles for creators and kind of probing what might be next in terms of unlocking a lot of opportunity. Um, so go ahead if you want to add more color. Yeah, sure, thanks. And um, thank you for joining Legion. Um, I'd, I'd love to just start with asking a general question about like, what is your definition of, of who a creator is? Like, who, what kind of counts? What's the threshold of being a creator? Can it be someone who is giving a makeup tutorial? Or I, I'm just curious, like kind of how you're thinking about that first. Yeah. Um... It's a good question because last year I tried to crowdsource a definition on Twitter um, and I posed this question to all of my followers and the answers were really all over the place. Some people define creator as anyone who posts anything online, like any any Instagram user was a creator if they had posted a photo. Some people's definitions were that broad. Some people defined it as like people who are making an income on these digital platforms. 
um, some people went even broader. They were like anyone who makes anything at all, like in the real world or in the digital world was a creator. Um, I think that maybe definitionally that is true, but it's just a little too broad of a definition to actually be useful to us if we're going to define creator as anyone who makes anything ever. Um, so the way that I typically scope it is people who are um, trying to build an audience online for the purpose of making an income from that. So there is a commercial business mindedness to it. It's not just creating things for the sake of creating things um, into perpetuity. There is like a economic interest that motivates it. I see. So yeah, that, that's interesting because I think of many creators, I think of they're, they're not necessarily in it to make money or build an audience, but they're simply kind of showing up and doing their thing to just express themselves creatively. Um, so I just wonder, you know, like if, I guess if your if your belief is that there has to be a monetary kind of translation or conversion at the end, um, that I think there's an aspiration of that. I don't think it's necessarily the reality for most people, but I think the aspiration has to be there. Otherwise, yeah. I consider them to just be an artist. To be artists, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think yeah. this is where there's like not really clear definitions yet, and yeah. and I think all of this is emerging. Um, but I, yeah, I draw a distinction between those who are aspiring to monetize and have a view, maybe in the really long term, to someday be able to to earn an income, versus those that are just creating for the sake of posting something. Like, I think the latter is like every Facebook user, every Instagram user, anyone who has right. ever shared anything on social media. If you if you can if you remove the commercial element, like all of those people are creators, and I just feel like that definition is not super useful to us. Um, and I think the economic imperative is, it scopes it more towards like digital entrepreneurs. Yeah, it needs to be a mean, meaningful difference from like the rest of us, I guess. So the second part of the question is, what, what kind of platforms or vehicles or venues are you noticing that are um, kind of underappreciated or underutilized currently by, by some of these creators that, you know, we might want to pay att more attention to or using platforms in perhaps unexpected ways? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I struggle to like name specific platforms because I think the, the term creator is just so broad. It's like anyone who is doing work online is a creator. Um, and it's just as vast as the offline world of all workers and entrepreneurs. Um, and so there's so many different verticals of online creator platforms that are helping people to monetize certain verticals, certain types of work, certain types of content mediums, et cetera. Um, but if I were to name a few, um, I, I mean, I'm happy to plug some of my portfolio companies. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think um, Streamloots is really interesting. They help gaming live streamers to better monetize their audience by selling digital interactions. Um, I think with COVID, like live live events like this have become really popular as a way to connect with an audience and build intimacy and that feeling of interactivity. Um, and there's so many new platforms that have emerged just in the past like nine months to support these kinds of events, um, but all with kind of different looks and feels, like some are more corporate, some are designed for conferences, others are for social events um, and have music, others are used for one-on-ones. Like I, I love Icebreaker, I think um, that's a really cool product for doing lots of speed yeah. one-on-ones to facilitate people meeting all, like a lot of other people, it sort of mimics um, being at like a speed dating or a cocktail party and meeting a lot of people right. in, in rapid succession. Um, I think people are using that to like engage with their audiences. I think a, a platform that not a lot of people are talking about as a creator platform or part of the stack of products that they're using is um, Slack and Discord, like mm -hmm. community products that are helping a creator who is putting out content um, to sort of elevate their community to the same level as them and to engage with them um, in a more networked fashion rather than just pushing content out. 
Cool. I know on the uh, on the monetization question, Mosin actually had uh, kind of a question about monetization and incentives and follow up. So I wanted to invite Mosin up to to ask this question. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on Hi. stage, guys. I appreciate it. Um, Lee, I'm a big fan of Means of Creation, which you and Nathan are doing are really great. Um, and I really love the essay as well. Um, so just to kind of read my question kind of verbatim, um, really love the essay and like the 10 different points you made on the platforms. And I think ultimately, like my question is, do you think PMs at like the larger platforms are uh, incentivized enough to actually start working on these features? Um, because like traditionally, it's the case where, you know, PMs are kind of aligned with like what an advertiser might want instead of, you know, the individual who is a creative or a creator. i um, curious to get like your thoughts on that and if you think that's going to shift. Yes. So I think this is still one of the open questions that I have coming out of writing this piece is to what extent um, are the strategies that I outlined and even this goal of having a middle class of creators, to what is, extent is it even necessary for people to put in place in order to build a successful business? Um, like, is it a good business strategy or is it a little too idealistic? And I, I don't know. Um, I think, I think for it to be successful, like platforms do have to create the sense that anyone could succeed. Like there has to be the possibility of success. I don't know if we're ever going to get to a world in which fifty percent of all of the creators on a platform are able to make a decent income. Um, like I, I don't know if that'll happen. I, I think platforms do have an incentive to reward the top tier of creators, like in a world with limited consumer attention in which consumers have so many different options for entertainment and fulfilling their boredom, like you do have to compete on the basis of the best content that you have on the platform. Like when we go to netflix.com, we're not shown the long tail of shows at the very mm -hmm. top of the screen. We're shown like the shows into which they've poured millions of dollars of production and marketing budgets. like these are the best originals that they have and they need to compete on that basis in a world with Hulu and Disney plus, et cetera. And similarly, I think when we open up TikTok, like they do need to show us the best content that they have. And so there's always going to be this effect of like, I think the returns will by and large still go to like the best creators on the platform. But I think maintaining a path for anyone to become one of the top creators is really important. And what about the advertising versus the direct pay question? Like is, I think you sort of addressed this a little bit in the essay, but is the advertising model, does it work at enough scale for the middle class? Or do you think the more like the Twitch, uh, you know, I mean, even I see Nabil shaking his head, no. <laughs> Seems like even at the the nope. fat head of the of the um, you know creator class, you end up having a tough time making ads make it, and that seems like that's going to be even further exacerbated um, in the in the middle class. So is is like a definitionally thing? If you want to actually have a middle class, you have to have a platform that enables direct pay relationships instead of advertising. Is that just like a law of gravity? I think that's true yeah. because I think. There's creators that are creating content that are really, really valuable to very small numbers of users that are just never going to be able to make much money from advertising. Like advertising will always reward scale and reach because they want to reach as many people as possible. And so I think for much of the long tail, it's never going to be like the bulk of their monetization. I do think that advertising, like we can spread advertising out more to encompass more creators. Like what I hear when I talk to advertisers today is they have the sense that like the long tail of creators doing brand deals with them is like quite cheap and it's like a really great deal to work with micro influencers versus working with, you know, the Kylie Jenners of the world. It's it's not worth the ROI and it's really expensive. So I think that suggests to me that like the long tail is being under like it's not advertisers not are not investing in them enough and they're being underpaid by advertisers versus mm. the top 
tier of creators are probably being overpaid. Mm -hmm. And so I think we could do some like redistribution and make advertising more accessible to long tail. But yeah, I, I think my, my broader point is, I think there's going to have to be direct fan monetization for much of the long tail. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. is, is the root here Lee making a case for digital socialism? Is that is that really what you're <laughs> define socialism? <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're not going down that rabbit. <laughs> I like it. Wow. <laughs> I'm <going> back. <laughs> I, I didn't um, mean that as a loaded term. I, I meant it in the kind of more, most as, abstract and academic sense. You're talking about economic redistribution in order to help the whole, right? Like, um, like in the in the in the English Premier League or the NFL sports league, they do this with advertising, right? There's massively more money made at Manchester United, um, you know, than at the Cleveland Browns. Just mix sports metaphors, and and yet they do an averaged ad deal. Right. So this in your example, that's YouTube deciding they're going to overpay everybody in the long tail. And if you're a massive advertiser, you're actually getting underpaid because it helps the whole. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think these platforms are already not free markets like they are making decisions that determine who is successful or not. Like they're the ones creating the algorithms that determine who shows up on the feed. They're determining all of the take rates, which like amount to a form of taxation. They get to set the taxation without any sort of voting mechanism of all of the participants. Sometimes there's progressive taxation. Sometimes there's regressive taxation, which is pretty common in a world in which like the, the highest earners, the biggest creators have a lot of sway over the platform. So I think it's already, it's already not a free market system at all. And I'm just pushing the platforms to be more thoughtful in their decisions, um, ultimately for the sake of their sustainability and their success, but also for the success of all of the emerging creators. There's also this, um, I think, phenomenon where the past 20 years, businesses have been all ad-driven, where we mentioned this earlier, growth at all costs is like the primary incentive and motivator. And if you were to upend that as the primary revenue model for some of these platforms that go into, you know, I just need a thousand fans paying me a hundred dollars a month or whatever that math looks like, it becomes there's something called donut economics. It's kind of crazy where there is, it's not socialism but it's a sort of fundamental restructuring of priorities where it's not about top line growth as the primary goal. It's actually sustainable growth of smaller chunks of business like subscriptions, for example. So um, I don't know that that's actually worthwhile or works for like YouTube. Uh, I know we try, on Ozzy Google, we tried it, um, but if it gets large enough and to support enough creators, does it become more valuable ultimately than the ad based uh, revenue model? I don't know. Yeah, I think, I mean, these are all interesting points about how creators can monetize themselves. But I thought another really interesting piece of your essay that hasn't really played out in the real world is how do investors or what are ways to basically invest in creators as they're up and coming and help them sort of bootstrap and get off the ground. And I wanted to bring in Max because I think he had a really interesting question to that point. Yeah, by the way, David, you gave such a nice introduction of Lee, but I actually read about you in a book called Run to Roar. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but uh, definitely want to talk offline about that. Um, <laughs> pretty smart player, by the way. Um, so Lee, so I guess going back to like where talent is like sourced from, how do you think traditional like scouting and talent like United Talent Agency, which just signed um, the D'Amelio family or like CAA is lacking within the creator economy? And how do you think underwriting new talent needs to change in regards to that? Um, yeah, I'm not as familiar with how talent is traditionally scouted. I think 
I, I sort of echo Alex's thoughts in his interview um, that I had cited at the very beginning of my essay, which is I think we just need to decentralize it and let the users decide what they would like to see. And so I think of, you know, I think of feeds and the algorithm as like a decentralized way of scouting up and coming talent where they'll inject videos with very few views and likes and followers into your feed and see if people enjoy it and engage with it. Um, like, I think that is the direction that we're moving to rather than having like a person decide who, who consumers are going to really enjoy hearing from. We talked a little bit about the um, kind of the creative houses, like the, you know, hype house and and that seems like an interesting phenomenon that, you know, I, I would guess that at least I don't have much visibility into the details of how those work. I wonder if, if you've sort of gotten deep with any of the people there and if there's, you know, anything about how do those get formed? Uh, who, you know, are they, how do they get structured? What are the economic incentives or agreements that might come about as part of that? Because I think the types of, um, you know, the kind of investing profile and the agreements that come up as part of creating a, kind of a, a hype house, um, you end up having, you know, distribution and monetization that kind of bootstraps off of each other in certain ways. And, and I'm just, I'm curious to learn more about how those actually work, if you have any behind the scenes knowledge. Yeah, there might be someone in the audience who probably knows more about this than I do, but from what I've read and researched, um, usually the talent that lives in those collab houses are managed by a single manager who has assembled the house. They provide the house, so they lease these houses and they give them for free to the talent to live in, to create content in. Um, and so the, the manager has economic upside in these people being together to create content together. Um, and does yeah. the manager of the house typically have their own audience they're bringing to it, or they're just a real estate provider and the, the people who are coming together are bringing their audiences for cross-pollination? Correct, yeah. The managers are usually like pretty obscure folks who are like professional managers and they, I think they help these creators get brand deals and like give them guidance on what to create, like mm -hmm. introduce them to new platforms, do all of the business side of, um, of like running these creators as businesses, just like tr traditional talent managers do. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then there, I think they have like guidelines for how much content they're supposed to create, um, the consistency of posting. And yeah, I think the, like there's talent managers that have houses across LA, um, mm -hmm. which they'll place the talent that they manage to work together. Okay, so they already have like a, maybe a talent agreement, like a, maybe this is how the old school, you know, uh, creative artists would have worked where they actually have an agreement with talent already in place. Then they bring their agreements and talent together to sort of cross pollinate and they help help everybody grow audience while, while growing the deals. Yeah, that's my understanding of how it works. Um, Taylor Lorenz would be the ultimate expert on this. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> I wish she were here to chime in. Um, <laughs> yeah it's it's not like a the creators aren't usually paying for it out of pocket or self-organizing this the talent manager plays a big role mm -hmm. that's really interesting is it similar for sort of the influencer incubators that you wrote about in your piece that are abroad is that a similar concept or is it like even more structured with more kind of like training and official curriculum built in yeah my understanding is the ones in China are much more structured. Um, like there's curriculums, there's programs, there's things they need to learn um, because they're taking these folks from not really having an audience at all and trying to turn them into influencers. So they, they're really scouting for talent and doing all of the interim training to get them to, to have a ton of followers. Whereas the managers that are um, sort of behind some of the platforms in the US, they're, they're kind of like sifting through the platforms looking for talent that's breaking out or that already have followers. Got it. So, yeah, I, I wonder how this kind of going back to the middle class concept, how 
either something like this could become more widespread and accessible to people who aren't on any talent manager's radar, or maybe even like thinking about how some of the benefits of these sorts of coalitions maybe do or at least could exist online. Like David mentioned that you have a pretty vibrant Slack community of your own, but have you seen or can you imagine um, kind of collaboration opportunities like this uh, being offered to more than just that top slice of people? Yeah, I, I think people are, there are creators who are sort of grassroots organizing their own houses, collectives, collaboration groups um, in a way that the platform or there's, there's no platform or manager that's driving it. Uh, so examples of this, there's like a few newsletter writer groups that I'm a part of that are in Telegram for the most part. Yeah, Telegram and Signal because we're all paranoid. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just talk about building our newsletters, benchmarks, we share numbers, we talk about um, like launching on product hunt, platforms to use. Um, so those are, and, and we're also collaborating together on pieces that we're writing. And there's a, a little bit of an informal, uh, like lifting up others as well going on where people will share they're writing, people boost each other on social. Um, there's like groups where people are are sharing their pieces while they're work in progress and others are giving feedback. Um, this is like the creator world that I'm the most familiar with because mm -hmm. I'm a newsletter writer, but I can imagine that it's also happening across other creator verticals too. Do you think that the creator group, the creator platforms should be investing in trying to enable these collabs early or do you think it should just happen more organically? Like I think like, you know, some of the stuff like type house is just like an organic offshoot of the, um, you know, of the work that Substack is doing. But you could imagine that Substack would have their own in-house team to help support and curate and boost, um, boost content and kind of writers. Do you, do you think that that's like, is there a, a timing on a, a natural evolution and a platform's growth when those kinds of things would be, you know, expected or natural or, or are there some, some that have gotten too big without addressing it, and it might be hard to sort of do at the scale they're operating. Yeah, well, I think the platforms and the creators sometimes have interests that are not fully aligned when it comes to this. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, for Type House, uh, which is the newsletter writers group that I'm a participant of, um, not everyone is on Substack. People have like there are some people who maybe even started on Substack that have migrated off for different mm. reasons. Mm -hmm. And so if it's if it's just a platform sanctioned group of collaborators, like we wouldn't have that I diversity see. of opinions. Um, I do think that like when it comes to certain aspects of collaboration, platforms are in a really great position to facilitate that. So there's a lot of like informal grassroots like bundling of newsletters that's already happening where people are teaming mm -hmm. up bundling their newsletter for a single price and sort of figuring out how to split that income between all the members of the bundle and i i believe that i think it, it would actually be um like the platform substack would be in a really great position to be able to suggest who you should bundle with because they have right everyone's email list they can see like how much your reader list is overlapping with someone else's mm -hmm. um, like what portion of that you share in common um, and they could sort of determine like okay you bundling with this other person it would be really fruitful for for both of you to do that um, so I think that type of collaboration would be really great to see mm -hmm. from a platform but for other aspects like I don't think creators are so loyal to a single platform that they would only want to ever talk to other creators mm -hmm. on that platform. Right. Well, yeah, as, as Misty and I were sort of brainstorming around, you know, how to create this middle class, we were sort of imagining the idea of what if you were responsible for running the TikTok algorithm? And we came up with this idea and said, what if you as a platform could identify what's trending? You obviously understand what's trending or what's about to break before it actually is visible to everybody else. And could you take, you know, let's say somebody who has maybe a thousand views, they've shown some aptitude 
within a format, but could you give like an early access or exclusive access to the topics or the content that's going to create a swell and then kind of get caught in the updraft? So I think you, you gave an example in your essay about um, how OutSchool gives feedback about the types of content that might get um, created and might be popular. I think that's like an example, but you can imagine somebody like, um, you know, like TikTok kind of exposing that, those ideas to creators who are not yet super famous, but who've shown aptitude. And I wonder, are there examples where people have done that in like a media creation format at, at a large scale, or are these kind of, it sounds like the out school example kind of happening organically, but maybe on a smaller scale than, than something like TikTok right now? Yeah, um, I was racking my brain the other day trying to think of other examples um, of this as well, where the platform is sort of guiding creators to the various niches that they could serve um, mm -hmm. and trying to guide them towards success. I couldn't think of any other examples of a platform explicitly doing this. I think this happens in more implicit ways. So, for instance, on TikTok, you see what's trending, you see, you know, the like there's a discover feed with like the trends that are happening right. and you sort of take that and you use that as inspiration for creating your own content or you'll do at people that are, you know, getting a ton of views and that's a way to be able to um, elevate yourself and to, mm -hmm. to increase your chances of being discovered. Um, I think creators are usually like they're pretty savvy in in having a feel for their audience and what their audience wants to see um, without having to do a lot of like surveying or mm -hmm. any, any sort of like very contrived things like that. I think the best creators just have this intuitive sense of like what the market would, would like to see from them. And they, they do that and then they, they like see how that's performed and they either do more of that or less of that. Um, but I think it's sort of similar to how I write things. I don't test these concepts with people mm -hmm. before I write them. I just have a sense of like what people would like to read about. And also I map that onto like what's interesting to me. And mm -hmm. then I create a blog post and and I, I unleash it onto the world. And if mm -hmm. it falls flat on its face, then I don't write about that anymore. And if it does really well, then that's a hint to me that like this is a topic that's really interesting to people. I think creators are Likewise, they have a feel for like content market fit and they're always kind mm -hmm. of like course correcting and shifting in different ways to try and get to that content market fit. OutSchool is like the only productized example I've seen of that. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's more that platforms could do. Outside of experimentation, do you find maybe something like you tweet about something, it gets a little bit of updraft and then you, you kind of say, hey, maybe this should actually be a longer form piece. Is that a natural part of Kind of your process yeah yes i do that a little bit too i use twitter as a way to like just test different ideas before i publish um the the folks at the everything bundle um mm -hmm. so nathan Bishes and dan yeah. shippers Anthony, they are really good about constantly talking to cus to readers and and figuring out what they want to see more of um after the end of every newsletter that they send out there's a q a which is like what did you think of this piece? Mm -hmm. And you can answer like amazing, good, like meh and mm -hmm. terrible. Right. I think those are the options. <laughs> and they collect that data at the end of every newsletter that they send out. And so you can actually see over time, like, okay, the rate of amazingness is going down or it's yep. going up. Like, and, and we're constantly like Nate and I, we write a newsletter together and we're constantly like t testing different ways to format the newsletter, different like, content that we can do and then looking at the rate of how many people are answering amazing to the newsletter right yeah awesome. I, I actually would love um laura to chime in because on the on the topic of content market fit um and a, a longer tail of people being able to find their audiences uh do you want to ask your question that was really good i think you're on mute laura thank you yeah there yeah. we go Hi. Um, well, I, I, this subject is so interesting to me. Um, just give a little, little bit of background. I was in film distribution uh, a long time ago, and then when things sort of moved to digital, was at the, about the time that I was working in film distribution. Um, and I thought at that time, you know, this all of the data that we're able to gather will lead exactly to like 
people being able to deliver more content. That's, you know, what people want. Um, and it's actually a really interesting question to me because I think that partly that has never really worked. Um, that, you know, if, if we could do that, studios would not release so many films. I mean, there's so much data that goes in on the film distribution side to trying to predict what will be successful. Um, that I, I am a little bit skeptical about how much we can predict that with just simply using data um, on a creative side. But I think there's also a real question in terms of middle class um, creators that if you're, if you're orienting around becoming a middle class creator on a platform like YouTube or TikTok, you're really have no control over your business. Whereas if you can find a way to make a business work where you do have more of a business plan and you're using business strategies, um, you may be able to sustain this for a much longer time. And I think, you know, Lee's been coming up with lots of ideas in this space for a long time. I, I've really enjoyed uh, how you think about it, Lee, but it's, it feels like uh, those kinds of platforms are can only really be lead generation, but your real business has to be somewhere else because you just have so little insight as um, about the, your customer base when you are depending on those kinds of adver advertising driven platforms. Yeah, um, I think there's one point that I didn't make super clearly in this talk, which I, I want to make right now, which is I think like, I think depending on any single platform to create a middle class of its own and to represent like the majority of a single creator's earnings, I don't know if that'll ever happen. I think it's a lot to ask of any platform to say like 50% of your creators need to fall into the middle class and they need to make that all from YouTube or all from Instagram or whatever. Like I, I, I don't know how realistic that is, but I do think the game changer of like creating a, a, a middle class of creators happens when people are able to stack income. Like I think the paradigm shift that is happening is people are treating their earnings as a portfolio of different revenue streams rather than viewing the world as one in which I need a single source of earnings and that source of earnings is like my salary and that's like all that I make throughout the year. Like I think that just is no longer the reality in a world of self-employment and platforms and lots of different options to make money. So I think what creators are doing already is they're stacking income from different sources. Like they'll have a Patreon. Um, they make a certain amount from Patreon every month. Then they have, I don't know, the creator fund. Then they'll make money from YouTube AdSense. Then they'll do uh, fan donations through coffee. Um, then maybe they'll sell a newsletter. Then they have like a paid Discord channel. Like there's just so many different ways for them to monetize and not all of it is like active effort monetization where they're doing something in order to earn an incremental dollar. And I think that is what the creator middle class looks like more and more. Not everyone makes a full-time income just from AdSense alone. I think it's combining all these different sources of income and monetizing super fans to a higher degree and monetizing your less super fans at, to like through advertising and maybe selling merch or getting donations or something like that. That's great. Well, you know, I think on that note, that's actually quite a nice summary of a lot of your, <laughs> your points and, uh, and a lot of kind of these new beliefs that we're exploring. And I noticed we're kind of running past the end of the hour. <laughs> so it, it turns out that the, uh, the timing is quite good. Um, so, you know, thanks. I, I do want to, Definitely thank Lee for coming to join us and, and share all of your kind of thinking and knowledge about this new space. I think it really helps us to wrestle with the ideas and, and kind of get smarter about it while also exploring some new avenues. So thank you for spending the time with us. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I might have spread some misinformation with the creator houses stuff. I'm not, people should fact check me on that. <laughs> Definitely well, some of them are managed by talent managers some of them might not be so i need to do more research no that's great i think i think it's great because now we have uh we've at least learned that this is an interesting thread to pull and, and we can explore yes. a little bit further so totally uh, yeah it's all it's all happening live so you know we have to just sort of work with the best we've got 
Um, but thank you for, for all the thinking here. And thanks to everybody who joined us on stage and off stage with questions. We've got tons of questions showing up in the chat. Uh, and of course, we didn't get to everything. So we'll make sure that we can um, can uh, follow up with some of those on Twitter or kind of in our newsletter. And then um, you know, we do have one final question that we always ask our featured guests we've got for Lee today. Uh, before then, I just want to make a quick announcement. We've got um, right now scheduled uh, coming up Jan 7th is Lenny Rachitsky, who I think you know Lee probably has collaborated with in the past, and um, he's another uh, another uh, newsletter writer who's got a, a great um, topic where he's he's also brought together this idea of a lot of his product work. He's building this grand unifying theory of growth that'll be out soon, and so we're going to have him on Jan 7th. So sign up for that. You can see the card, um, and we'll also be doing some more ad hoc events in between now and then. Um, and uh, if you have people that you'd like to see on Highlighter, uh, feel free to uh, chime in on Twitter or email us hello at highlighter.com, and, uh, and we'll we'll get some more great creators uh, and uh, great featured guests. So, with that, I want to now you know we spent the time here asking you questions, Lee, and now we want to turn the tables, and we want to give you the chance to ask a question. And that can be a question to us or a question broadly to the world about um, you know, what are you most curious about today? What are the things that are piquing your interest? And it could be serious. It could be wide ranging and philosophical. It could be totally flippant and, and trivial. But what are the things that are kind of most on your mind at this moment? Yeah, um, I'm just really curious what comes to mind for people when we're discussing these topics? Like, do they think it's important to create a creator middle class? Am I totally off base here? Um, is this something that they think is important for platforms to do? Um, I'm also really interested in why people are building technology. Like, mm -hmm. what is driving everyone? What's What are people's underlying motivations? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to hear everyone's like predictions for the future of the creator economy too. Right. That sounds like a, a good That's topic. A lot. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of topics there to unpack. We can maybe kick it off on, uh, on Twitter or we'll, we'll have you back for another session where we can discuss those. Yeah. My DMS are open on Twitter. It's Elgen 18 is my handle, or you can email me, um, Lee at Lee dash co. And sign up for my newsletter, lee.substack.com. That's it. Yeah, we'll paste that in the chat, and that'll show up with the video after the fact, too. Cool. Well, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much, Lee. Thank you guys Thank so you much. Happy holidays. I really enjoyed it. Happy holidays. Okay. Bye. Yeah.